Social credit is a body of socio-economic and political thought developed by the British engineer Major C. H. Douglas. In this short video, we will examine the social credit analysis of the problems that characterize our current economic system, as well as its remedial proposals. Once implemented, these proposals would finally allow economic associations to fulfill their true purposes, the delivery of the goods and services that people need to survive and flourish with the least amount of resource consumption and of human labor. First off, it must be understood that most of the money supply, 95% or more, exists in the form of intangible numbers or bank credit instead of notes and coins. This bank credit is created every time a bank makes a loan or a purchase and is destroyed every time a bank loan is paid down or a bank purchase is sold back to the public. The banking system, with its system of money creation, is the primary method for financing, directly or indirectly, the production of goods and services by businesses of all types and even by governments. For example, a productive organization can borrow money into existence from a private bank and then spend it on obtaining the raw materials, labor, machinery, etc. needed to produce its goods or services. Money is paid out to consumers via wages, salaries and dividends during this process of production and is then available to buy the resultant consumer goods and services. Upon receipt of this consumer income transformed into business revenue, the productive organization will pay down its production loans with the bank. The money and the debt then cancel each other out of existence. The financing of production can be, and often is, more complicated than this, but we will use it as our basic model as it makes the explanation easier. So what is wrong with this setup? The problem is that the way things work in practice is not how they are supposed to work in theory. The system is not inherently balanced. You see, the financial system, as it applies to industrial production, is either self-liquidating or it is not. That is, it either distributes income to consumers at the same rate that it is building up costs and generating prices, or it does not by only distributing a portion of the incomes that are required to liquidate costs in full. Orthodox economics says, or rather assumes, that the price system is self-liquidating. Social credit, by contrast, claims that the price system is not self-liquidating. There are many reasons for this inherent deficiency of consumer income, for this gap between the flow of costs, and hence prices on the one hand, and the flow of consumer incomes on the other. The main cause has to do with the fact that businesses have to recover more money from the public, mainly to meet machinery costs, such as capital loan repayments, depreciation and maintenance costs, than they simultaneously distribute to the public in the form of wages, salaries and dividends. Now the gap between prices and incomes has to be filled in full. Otherwise, the economy will be overtaken by recession or worse. Increasing bankruptcies and a steady increase in unemployment could spiral things out of control, leaving the economy on the verge of collapse. In theory, the price-income gap can be filled either with additional debt money borrowed into existence from the private banks and issued for additional production or directly to consumers as loans, or it can be filled via the issuance of new credit, free of debt or the necessity of repayment, by some organ of the state to consumers or on their behalf. The present economic system makes use of the first course of action. Social credit recommends the second. Filling the gap with additional debt money transfers and does not liquidate costs. It therefore leaves an ever-increasing residue of debt that must be repaid out of future economic activity. This makes equilibrium dependent on continuous growth, whether it is physically needed or not, and the creation of new jobs, 
whether genuinely useful or not, to distribute incomes. It is also the primary driver of constant inflation or the steadily diminishing buying power of each unit of currency. As the debt load, public, corporate, and personal increases, more money must be paid out by consumers to service the debt in loan repayments, taxes, and prices. This erodes consumer purchasing power, thus moving consumers to demand wage and salary increases to maintain the standard of living. But since wage and salary increases must eventually be recovered in increased prices, the general price level rises, and thus increasing the need for more debt money to fill an increased gap. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Indeed, other problems as varied as the phenomena of poverty in the midst of plenty, or servility in place of freedom, the recurring cycle of boom and bust, heavy and often increasing taxation, the centralization of economic wealth, privilege, and power in fewer and fewer hands, social conflict, forced migration, cultural dislocation, environmental degradation, and international economic conflict leading to war are all heavily implicated in the ever more debt solution to the recurring price income gap. The alternative is to fill the gap the social credit way with a sufficient flow of compensatory debt-free credit to equate the flow of consumer incomes with the flow of prices. This would ensure the final liquidation of all costs. There would be no debt residue to make demands on future cycles of production. Part of the debt-free credit would be distributed via a retail or compensated price discount on all consumer goods and services, while the remainder would be issued to all citizens as a periodic national dividend whether they were employed or not. This model of full and continuous debt redemption would put an end to the exponentially increasing burden of unrepayable debt. It is the no more debt solution to the recurring price income gap. An automatically self-liquidating or balanced financial system along social credit lines would also yield the following benefits. Absolute economic security for every citizen in place of poverty and the threat of poverty. Increasing leisure in place of servility. That is, freedom from wage slavery, debt slavery, and useless, witless, and or destructive employment. The decentralization of economic wealth and power. The elimination of economic waste and sabotage. Continual reductions in prices instead of constant inflation. Much lower taxes. Much less government regulation and interference. Economic cooperation instead of ruthless competition. Social stability and an end to mass migrations. The transformation of civilization based on the unfettering of the creative impulse and the flourishing of both folk culture and high culture environmental protection, conservation and repair, and mutually beneficial international trade providing a sound foundation for world peace.